I V M. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories, India's very own travel podcast. Where each week we share the journey of travelers in their own words and relive their experiences with you, our listeners. Hi guys, welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories. Hope you're all well and keeping safe. First things first, we have a winner of the giveaway of Final Road's W book, Lords of the Deccan, that we covered on our previous episode. And the winner is Sarbani Mohapatra from Kolkata. Congratulations, you will be hearing from us soon. On the podcast today, we talk to Akshita Bhanjdiyo, director of the Belgaria Palace, as we talk about the rich history and culture of Mayur Bhanj, Odisha's largest district and an erstwhile princely state. Let's hop on to the episode and find out more. Remember the days when our granny used to narrate once upon a time stories let's bring back the good old days of moral stories with story time tamil hi i am ravishankar balachandran host of story time tamil podcast i would like you to entertain and educate your children with stories from story time tamil tune in to the new episode sharp at 7 pm every day on ivm website ivm podcast app youtube channel or wherever you get your podcast from So with that introduction we'd love to welcome Akshita Bhanjdeo director at the Belgaria Palace an 18th century heritage boutique property located in Baripada Mayurbhanj Odisha Akshita thank you so much for being a part of the Musafir stories and welcome to the podcast Johar hello thank you so much for having me very excited to be here Thank you Akshita it's it is a pleasure to have you on the podcast and um The introduction I gave is very short and concise so why don't you speak a little bit more about yourself Akshita and uh, also what you do Sure happy to So hi everyone my name is Akshita Bhanjdeo I am the director of the Belgaria Palace an 18th century boutique property in the eastern state of Orissa I'm from Mayurbhanj which is one of which is Orissa's largest district and one of its most populous I'm actually living in Baripada which is the district headquarters of Mayurbhanj and this is my home my ancestors have been here this is my ancestral home and given the pandemic and actually a year before the pandemic I decided to move back here along with my family to restore our home and open it up to visitors from all over the world so it's really given me a chance to reconnect with my roots and discover um the state discover its language cuisine festivals just um you know being really absorbing the day to day of rural life has been really exciting uh, i do have a full time job so i work in agritech um i work with an artificial intelligence nonprofit so it's been really exciting to actually be remote working from baripada mayurbhanj and still being quite globally connected to what's happening especially to a field that i'm very much uh, hold dear to my heart which is you know uh, social impact So it's really interesting to be able to have this life and sort of discover and rediscover parts of not just the country but also myself. Thank you Akshita and yeah we are eagerly looking forward to uh discovering Mayur Bhanj. Uh, okay. The process of uh, researching for this episode was also very eye opening for me uh because My- Mayur Bhanj is rich in so many different aspects yeah. that uh, <laughs> uh I have to admit that uh, I had really been very ignorant of i'm sure a lot of other people also wouldn't have known a lot about this and that's why i think it's great to hear uh, hear from uh, you who's also currently based um, out of mayurbhanj and uh, you are from mayurbhanj right so yeah. listening to a local um, but uh, yeah please give us a little bit more in terms of uh, background of mayurbhanj akshita where mayurbhanj is located Yeah so mayurbhanj is located in the eastern state of orissa um which is you know in the east of india it's bordered by being west bengal and jharkhand uh, chatisgarh um to the west and uh, slightly andhra as well andhra pradesh um the north of mm-hmm. mayurbhanj exactly the state the district however is only bordered by west bengal and jharkhand 
So we are a really, we're a landlocked uh, district. However, we have a really interesting topography and, and uh, geography as well. So about more than a fourth of the district is covered by the Simlipal Elephant and Tiger Reserve, which is also a UNESCO biosphere, which makes the district in, in itself extremely beautiful, extremely diverse, which has a lot of rolling lush hills, um, you know, these beautiful majestic waterfalls. We have India's second and seventh highest waterfalls. Um, we also have mm -hmm. the world's only melanistic tiger, the black tiger, as it's called, in Simlipal. And we have a number of different arts and crafts and cultures. So actually, Mayubhanch's tagline has always been the land of art and culture, because it's a little bit of a microcosm of the kind of arts and crafts you find in the East. And um, I think a lot of it is because of the fact that we have over 40 different kinds of indigenous communities settled in Mayurbanj across the millennia. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when I start talking about Mayurbanj, for me, what's always interesting is the fact that Mayurbanj has been, um, has Paleolithic uh, rocks from different stone ages. That means that we've actually had human civilization here for an extremely long amount of time. And um, you get to see these beautiful rock formations. We're also really famous because we have some of the richest deposits of iron ore in the country. So one of the most famous stories of Mayubhanch is how Maharaja Sri Ram Chandra Bhanjdeo in 1904 invited a Parsi gentleman called J.N. Tata to come and, you know, mm -hmm. have a look at these um, iron ore deposits and, you know, come up with India's first iron ore and steel factory to actually to you know the vision was to make sure that Indians um, were able to you know build their own iron ore and of course that is you know the age of industrialization that they wanted to have and um, of course we know who this gentleman turned out to be and his legacy he left uh, behind uh, so it's really great to sort of know that one of India's largest conglomerates have has their roots in Mayurbhanj. Yeah just listening to all of this uh not just the rich culture and the heritage of the place, but also the really rich flora, fauna uh, with Simlipal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, all of this. They're also one of the biggest districts of um, Odisha, right? Yeah. A lot, a lot of things it has going for it, but we, a lot of people just don't know about this, which is very unfortunate and sad. But Akshita is doing a wonderful job in uh, making more people aware of these through the different things he's doing and the different efforts she's carrying out as well so we'll certainly double click on a lot of these things today and find out um, more and learn more from Akshita why one should visit Mayurbhanj and um, what, what are some of the things it has to, has to offer. Uh, now just in terms of getting to Mayurbhanj you did mention that it is in the eastern part of Odisha. If one has to get to um, Mayur Banj, mm -hmm. in terms of access, what would be the preferred mode of getting there? Yeah, so we have you know, the two closest international airports for international listeners I would start off with are at in Kolkata and Bhubaneswar, which are both four to five hours away by road. Um, but we do have rail and uh, bus connectivity. So we are equidistant by road to actually Bhubaneswar and Kolkata, as I mentioned. But also we are, Baripada, the headquarters, is two and a half hours from Jamshedpur and about six hours from Ranchi, six hours from Puri. I'm naming the closest big cities and towns. So we're actually really well connected to, you know, uh, you know, big cities in Orissa, in Jharkhand, and as well as Bengal. But I recommend, you know, basis the person's preference, you know, flying into Calcutta or Bhuvaneshwar, um, more so Bhuvaneshwar, because you actually get to see a little bit of what coastal Orissa is like before you come into the northern area, which is known so much for its tropical topography. Yep. Wonderful. So very, very accessible and uh, also makes for, uh, especially people living close by, makes for a great road trip, mm -hmm. right? Could be a weekend or even much longer. We'll speak of uh, some of the options one has yeah. when visiting Mayurbhanj. But thanks so much for um, kind of calling out the geographical orientation and how one can get to Mayurbhanj. Um, now, before we jump into uh, the specifics and also talk a little bit more about the Belgardia Palace, mm -hmm. uh, would you also shed some more light about... Mayur Bhanj, the state, right? Yeah. Um, it has been one of the princely states of India and uh, the Bhanj uh, dynasty has actually been one of the iconic dynasties of the place as well. And also your connection to the dynasty, right? We haven't addressed this so far in the podcast, <laughs> but for the first time we have royalty on the podcast too. So uh, we're really excited about that. So actually, why don't you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. 
um so you know mayuban for listeners who are not familiar with the history of south asia in some ways south asia used to be a conglomeration of different princely states uh, in, in what is now present india india you could say about 575 and mayuban state were also uh, called as an uh, morbhanj in a lot of the british documents was one of these princely states of india during the you know predominantly in documented during the british raj but of course like most princely states you know predates this by hundreds of years it was one of the largest states of the eastern states agency and one of the three states of the bengal states agency so um mm-hmm. you know a, a fun fact is that the emblem of the state is still two peacocks for according to legend the ancestors of um the rulers originated from the sage vashish uh, pea fowl's eyes so mm-hmm. you know our gotra till date is still uh, that of being a, a vashish um you know but mm-hmm. mayuban state has you know the the first bhanj ruler was documented through stone scriptures actually in 598 ad uh, before the the bhanj dynasty you actually have the bhomakara dynasty and kalinga has had many famous uh, dynasties one of them which was bhomakara kora and during this period there might have been um you know a family which sort of gained a lot of you know through their leadership prowess um maybe you know uh, being part of uh, you know community you know whether that's building or protection uh, and that's when you see the bhanj dynasty name really start to appear uh, what's obviously been interesting to me for mostly when you study princely rulers and dynasties is not so much that they've come into power because many have you know through the rise and fall of dynasties but it's always been the fact that families have been able to sustain itself in this case for almost 1500 years so because the dynasty and the bhanj rulers had been in this part of orissa for so long a lot of the architecture art the patronage of the arts and culture all still have a lot of um, intermingling and a and a lot of uh, you know you can see a lot of my ancestors presence and vision in a lot of the art forms a lot of the building of the district as well which is really really of course interesting to me as being a student of history and a and a scholar very much obsessed with mythology and um, you know what happened in the past and what can we learn from it yeah some really great things to learn about the banja dynasty and its origins and also uh, thank you for the back story of the emblem with the two peacocks as well mm-hmm. right and yeah. uh, i mean it also is a part of the name of the place so one can kind of figure out how how the importance is right of the peacock and the story by the way akshita is what the 48th uh, generation of uh, the family i think right akshita yes. yeah yes yes 48 <laughs> so, <laughs> Akshita has a very, very uh, personal connection there as well. And uh, um, also the place, uh, obviously, uh, we'll speak a lot more about Mayur Bhanj, but even Belgaria Palace that uh, Akshita is the director at, we'll speak a little bit more about that because that is also very personal. Uh, Belgaria Palace used to be um, a palace for uh, uh, hosting foreign dignitaries in the past, right, um, Akshita? Yeah, please tell us a little bit more about that. So we come from mm-hmm. a place in Mayurbhanj which is still presently there it's called Kitching um it used to be called Kitchinga Mandala or Kitchinga Kota this is when you when you find stone inscriptions and you know you know edicts which have stayed on uh, from the Bhanj dynasty's main fort you could say and uh, some of it actually even mentions uh, like a lot of uh, local people actually even mention this in terms of the Mahabharat because you have the king Kichak and Viratgarh if you mm-hmm. think of you know you remember the pandavas there are a lot of parts of mayurbhanj actually which share a lot of mythological stories um you know whether the mm-hmm. pandavas being in exile or you remember parts of when they were exiled they were in king kichak's court so uh, kitching is still mm-hmm. present there it's still the it's our main temple it's our ishta devi so we we follow the idol there and uh, funnily enough you know after kitching which is our first uh, fort and uh, you know you could say former palace our original palace we moved from there to haripur this was in the 14th century so kitching is still there it's uh, you know a great um, place to look at kalinga architecture it's made out of black stone uh, after kitching you actually see the next fort that came up in the bhans uh, dynasty's history which was haripur Now Haripur is extremely mm-hmm. interesting for me because it's mentioned in Akbar's biography the Akbar Nama because there were um, there were so many you know wars that were fought especially with Feroz Shah Tughlaq when he came to take over this part of Orissa and um, you know he kept speaking about this 
this this one fort which was surrounded by so much jungles and and you know had a dense guerrilla warfare happening it was very hard for them to capture this was haripur and mm-hmm. after haripur there was actually a, another fort we had closer to uh, between uh, khiching and baripuda which was completely under attack by the marathas and so was uh, you know broken down uh, this fort there's nothing we could find of it except maybe old stones that are lying around the area but we actually managed to trace the door of that fort which uh, has now turned up in a hotel in madurai and it's still called the mayur dwar so someone actually sent me a picture of it when they were there so funny how history comes back to later generations in different ways <laughs> and uh, the present palace the main belgaria palace was actually built by one of my ancestors a female a, a, a woman her name was uh, her highness maharani sumitra devi now mm-hmm. what's really interesting is this palace was built in 1804 and that's very early for the british and especially indians to be influenced by victorian architecture this was a little before victoria but you can call it victorian because of the kind of uh, columns and the greek roman architecture which was favored by england at the time and uh, so the when when the main mayurbhanj palace was built which had over 100 rooms an indoor swimming pool 8 to 10 courtyards uh you know different terracotta temples within it um and these beautiful gargoyles and kind of resembled the buckingham palace if you look at it from the outside um the belgaria palace was built side by side to it uh, of course just one you know uh, a small very small section of it at the time in 1804 it really got massive renovations in the 1900s because you know sumitra devi realized that she was fighting these wars against the marathas against the british uh against you know nearing nearby other princely states in which would now be in present day jharkhand and bihar and orissa and you know she was you know you know she realized that you know mayurbhanj needed this rebranding exercise and and her vision actually paid off because she realized that she wanted to get foreign dignitaries and call you know influential people from all over the world to come to mayurbhanj to experience it and you know invest in it and really be able to mm-hmm. invest in the talent and the entrepreneurship and you know have this confluence of ideas yeah one would one would think right uh, that this is 1804 uh, it might have been like a very patriarchal or um, male dominated right. uh, yeah. society and more so for royalty and it's really heartening to find out how progressive it was and uh, how maharani sumitra devi right you said yes. the name um, yes. who actually um, commissioned the building of this palace and uh, we're talking of make in india now but looks like <laughs> it's already a borrowed concept from back in the day right you yeah. were inviting um, like the family was inviting investors to come over right and uh, that th- this is where most of those uh, people foreign dignitaries and visitors would be housed and um, those yes. are the origins of the palace yeah T- talk to us a little bit more about the palace very interesting uh, structures were well, like you said uh, influences of roman greek, ar- greek architecture um, and uh, how did this thought about um, because this was or this is still your residence as well right so how did the idea of uh, one renovating this and also opening this up to um, other people to come and um, find out more uh, learn about not just the place but also the state and the family uh, how did that come to mind when we had the, when we had the property and my you know my grandmother was still alive at the time um, and you know she, my grandmother's from nepal uh, she's actually the daughter of uh, the late his highness king thrubuvan and she's had a very interesting history as well and you know she remembered my grandfather always uh, you know thinking about and maybe th- you know having people over and you know restoring a part of belgaria to for it to be completely you know in hospitality i'm not sure if she had this as her exact uh, blueprint in mind but the idea of entertaining always kind of being an ambassador to mayurbhanj and orissa in any way we could was always present there so i always remembered my grandparents all you know inviting people over for different festivals uh opening up the house for different uh you know for the public to come in hosting different community initiatives here whether it was making sure that artists and arts were always done, always under patronage uh you know having the house be more of a platform than a property so i think when we when my me and my sister had both studied abroad for 10 year 10 odd years we had done our high school uh, in international boarding school in singapore and my sister had uh, you know me and my sister both went to the united states as devi scholars to study so especially more so for her because she had this idea when she had been traveling europe and different parts of america and she you know she kind of saw the heritage houses and the 
way that they had been able to generate income not only for themselves but for the surrounding community whether it was through initiatives like farm to table or you know you know having museums for artists and artist residencies um you know my sister realized that there was an opportunity to you know model the house in this very boutique art deco design at the same time being able to you know hire locally skill locally be able to market a lot of the local products in a way that could suit an international palate and taste so she decided to come back from new york and you know move straight into mayurbhanj started the restoration process started um you know building this house up and i was a bit more skeptical to be honest so when my sister came back there was such an overwhelming response from both the local communities who wanted to be part of the house in some way whether it was coming and showcasing their arts and artifacts like dokra and sabai to guests or actually having young youth who were you know wanting to be naturalists and guides and show people everything from what the different kinds of exotic birds that were found here to actually taking them through nature trails um you know where indigenous populations knew about such ancient had such ancient knowledge to share about crops and grains that our ancestors ate and consumed yeah 100% and uh, also the it is a great story uh, not just of uh, the entrepreneurial spirit but uh, i don't know how many times you mentioned local uh, throughout your response <laughs> right you've kind of focused on that and it really shows it stresses right it's not like an ivory castle or an ivory tower that you're creating it is something that is actually being supported and um, fully vested in by the local community out there which is very very important for sustainability which is also another key theme of the property mm-hmm. right and uh, also i can't stop going gaga over just the aesthetics of it just the rooms and the uh, you have to the most part maintained the original structure obviously in terms of uh, um, preservation and renovation you have improved upon it um, and m- made it more uh, contemporary that way but uh, still a lot of the original structure has been uh, kind of retained and improved upon right so do you want to speak a little bit more to uh, what are the kind of experiences and um, what are the kind of rooms also very very uh, beautiful colors the antique furniture ceiling uh, high ceilings all of that i was really blown over we'll just definitely share some pictures mm-hmm. too along with the podcast but uh, would you like to speak a little bit more to that Akshita? definitely so you know my like i said my family has a bit of mixed culture because both my grandmothers came from nepal and my mother herself is from the royal family of jaisalmer so a lot of the pers- a lot of our tastes you know in our family have been influenced by not just orissa and the local culture but also the history of the place which has of course uh, been built during during the 1800s and 1900s and uh, you know seen a lot of uh, you know it's it, the house itself is seen both the world wars the bengal renaissance you know it's seen the independence movement so there's so much uh, in terms of just the content once you step inside uh, but to step back for a second it's this you know it's it was built on a hill so you drive into baripada and it's right opposite the fire station which is it's just quaint building built from 100 years ago it's very nondescript because it's in this it's a little bit in the center of the city you know we had to put up these massive neon lit signs um for people to realize that it was actually the palace um uh, because like i said it was a home for foreign dignitaries you know for one or two lords and ladies or governors who were visiting uh, but it wasn't like an entertainment leisure house which is you know has this long winding driveway about 100 meters and on the right and left you actually have these uh beautiful lawns which my grandparents have grown a lot of different uh you know uh, flowers uh, and uh, different kinds of plants on so as you come in there these mehndi lined hedges which of course i use throughout the year for different <laughs> things and then um, you know on the left we actually copied our uh, this the indoor swimming pool which was in the main belgaria palace and we uh, restored you know built it back in belgaria so we had this outdoor swimming pool and then you have this beautiful um, open air columned space um with a lot of ionic and doric themes on it so ionic doric and corinthian are three kind of columns you'll find in victorian architecture which have you see this long column you know rising up and then you have a lot of nature floral um imagery on it and once you enter it's actually called the hathi baranda because elephants would come on on this root so it was it's got this red lateroid soil which is found all across mayurbhanj has this beautiful smell when rain hits it actually it's lovely in the monsoons 
and uh, you enter into this porch and you'll see one thing in Belgaria though is that even though it's got this very British architecture, uh, European looking building, it's got this, um, you know, a lot of the local crafts. So you enter and there are these two, uh, you know, three feet elephants of made of black stone, um, hand carvings, you know, floral carvings all over them. And as you walk up the steps onto the porch, you know, which has these high arches, uh, long French bay windows, a lot of shutters, which is very reminiscent of the Bengal School of Architecture at that time, you know. Um, and then you enter the house and we have this long staircase with M embossed in it. So you'll see a lot of our emblem embossed on the windows or across the house. And as soon as you enter, there's this, and we call it the Edo Ballroom, because a uh, famous place that my uh, ancestor Maharaja Sri Ram Chandra Bhanshtyo, who is the Bhansh dynasty's most famous ruler, called also known as the Philosopher King. Um, so we named it after him going to Japan. He said it was his favorite country, and if he was born again, he'd want to be born in Japan. So, and because he had spent so much time in Japan, we actually called it the Edo Ballroom because of the Mayurbhanj connection with Japan. So, you know, each, we call it the Wes Anderson-esque decoration because when my sister and uh, my mother, who were primarily responsible for the restoration, when they were doing the house, they actually looked for all the old pictures. Um, all the furniture was from the three different palaces. Nothing was new or, you know, bought newly. Everything was reupholstered, recycled, upcycled. So, you know, doors became windows, uh, terracotta pots became sinks. And uh, <laughs> I remember when we had like these really old, um, you know, everything from our, except the wiring electricals and the amenities being, you know, uh, completely you know, new and having to be redone for obvious reasons and, you know, bringing in the internet and Wi-Fi and all of that. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we kept everything just as it was. So even the bathrooms have these beautiful uh, claw-footed bathtubs, which I absolutely love because who has the luxury of these uh, extremely old, quaint uh, bathrooms and uh, everything that went in it. Um, and when when you enter the Edo ballroom, which was, you know, like I said, the house was used for leisure and for entertaining. And something important was that uh, the person I mentioned, Maharaja Sri Ram Chandra he his second wife was the daughter of the very famous Bengal Renaissance philo uh, reformer called Keshav Chandra Sen, his third daughter, Such mm -hmm. Maharani Sucharu Devi. So she brought with her, especially because this house was used so much in the turn of the century and then the 19... Um, you know, right before the period of uh, World War One and the 1920s, there was a lot of famous artists and philosophers and poets and, and um, you know, social reformers who came to the house during that period, you know, the turn of the century and the 20th century, uh, when there was so much influx of ideas happening in the East, especially. So you see a lot of that because of the kind of, you know, we had libraries and a projector room. You, we had these beautiful uh, Burma, Burma teakwood, um, you know, bars and vinyl record players in each of the rooms. We, we, our libraries have some of the most fantastic collections of limited edition and, um, um, you know, special edition prints. One of my favorites, I found the book Casanova, a limited edition mm. print in one of my ancestors' <laughs> rooms. And, uh, you know, the Arabian Nights and Virginia Woolf and all of that. And, of course, you have paintings from Hemindranath Majumdar, um, you know, so there's this, there are these beautiful oil canvas paintings which light up all the rooms. And the colors, like I said, very Wes Anderson-esque because it's all, you know, all of them are almost jewel toned. So we, you know, all the rooms had like pink and salmon and, and you know, this mahogany deep green and this ox blood, which is my favorite, you know, uh, red. And there's one room we named after, it's called the Bengal Renaissance Room because we know that's where Maharani Sucharu Devi stayed when she visited. Um, so our rooms are divided into standards, deluxes and suites because the shapes were just so, you know, like you, the beauty of boutique properties is that they have their own story to tell. It's not a one size fits all. It's not a cookie cutter um, design of what we see with, you know, massive chain hotels, uh, which are backed by industries and companies. These are homes and these are, you know, family homes. So each of the rooms have been inspired by different personalities in the family or different people who came and stayed there for a long period of time. So we have the Empress Suite because the Mayurbhan family had a lot of connections with the royal families in the Middle East. Um, or it has the Narayan Hiti room. Narayan Hiti was the main palace of the Nepalese, Nepal royal family and monarchy. Then the Bengal Renaissance room, like I said. And then we had the Victorian Suite because we knew of so many of the lords and ladies who had came and visited. 
Um, you know, someone who famously came and stayed was Dr. Annie Besant, who was an Irish theosophist and social reformer. And it's so mm-hmm. amazing that they came to Bilgaria at a time when, you know, we, uh, uh, she was speaking about Irish independence to a crowd in Bayupada. And of course, because at the time they couldn't speak on Indian independence, but it was the same values. And the fact that Bilgaria was a hotbed of this kind of thinking and activity, extremely progressive, extremely uh, reformist, and really trying to imagine what a new India could be like. So uh, our downstairs room especially is pays homage to a lot of the communities that form Mayurubanj, an integral part, and you know the arts of it. So you have the Dokra room, the Chow room. We have one room which has a lot of art from the Santhali tribe, and so you have named the Santhal room, and uh, we, as and where we can, we always try to put Dokra, which is a 4,000 year old lost art of uh, lost wax art technique, and we have a lot of sabai grass, which is found, um, you know, all over Greater Mayurbhanj, which is parts of Jharkhand, Bengal, um, and present-day districts of Balasore and Nilgiri as well. So we actually have these beautiful and, of course, Patajitra um, and filigree, and uh, you know, whether it's lac or tasar. So it's beautiful to actually have where the outside comes in, have these nature motifs through our wallpapers, which have elephant motifs on it, or um, you know, floral, botanical motifs on it. And you know, uh, you, when you walk through the rooms, whether it's projector room, which used to be the projector room, we obviously just made it into a more modern day projector, or you listen to Hindustani mm-hmm. classical and jazz, on the vinyl record players and actually get to see some of the tablas and harmoniums and the esraj, which is one of the instruments that the family used um, and that was popular in our in the Mayurbhanj Gharana. So there's this beautiful confluence of India because at least for me, I hadn't been to a lot of heritage places which had a mix of indigenous culture, a mix of various royal uh, you know, uh, in, uh, personalities and influence from different royal families in India. Like like I said, Rajasthan, Nepal, and Orissa is quite an interesting mix to have. Um, and then, of course, you know, when you when you go to the projector room, the bo- dining room, the living rooms, the libraries, and then you come to the spaces to eat, the cuisine is just, it's just magnificent because Orissa has this very um, underrated cuisine and you know the kind of everything from the crockery to the cutlery like you know eating pokhalo which is really famous you know we even have pokhalo devas in orissa and which is basically fermented rice uh, a bit watery but you use a number of different condiments everything from fish spices um you know coriander chilies uh, the different kinds of chutneys using aubergine and tomatoes in yams and sweet potatoes in ways that i've never had before um, but the, the cuisine of Odisha is just so famous. So something we like to do is this Odia Thali for our guests because you have, you know, you eat in terracotta pots on um, and plates on banana leaf, obviously with your hands. Cause that's the only way to eat <laughs> this amazing God's food. And um, it, to be able to come from a family, I'm very lucky because we have a lot of Nepali, Nepali, Nepali uh, dishes and food that uh, have, you know, been passed down as family recipes. So that's always in these very old bronze and kansa. Kansa is a mix of three different kinds of um, iron and alloys. So, you know, being, I think it's bronze, copper and iron, if I'm not mistaken. And so it's really beautiful to use these old cutlery and crockery that's been passed down and actually eat the way that maybe my ancestors did. And, and we, we have a temple in the property as well, which has these very, very intriguing eyes actually um, fixed in metal on them. It's the eyes of the goddess. So you have the three eyes. And so, I, and if you've read The Great Gatsby, there's this very, um, you know, symbolic reason of having these eyes watching you. But it's very, it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting mix for me. And it's like I said, it's just, it, I always think of it as very art deco house. Like you walk into a room and it always has a different color, a different ambience, a different feel. I love being surrounded by art, books and music. You know, that's a really important thing for a theme for me when I'm in a space. And um, one of my favorite things is actually the furniture. Because when, uh, Mm -hmm. so, you know, India gained independence in 1947. But Mayurbhanj actually joined the Union of India in 1st January 1949. So actually it ran as an independent um, there was an experiment of democracy, you can call it, that Mayubanj had for a uh, little over a year. A lot of all my, my ancestors had basically wanted all the palaces and main, their main residences to become schools and colleges. Uh, the one in Shillong, the summer palace of the Mayubanj royal family, actually is still the only IM in the East, if I'm not mistaken. 
mm-hmm. and the one in Calcutta is also on Mayurbhanj Road, as it is called. Um, Raja Bag also was is now with the West Bengal ITI. You know, it's an ITI school, and the one, like I said, the one mm-hmm. in the main Mayurbhanj Palace, like the one that's shaped on Buckingham, has become a high school and college. But Belgaria had just few furniture pieces that each of the personalities chose during the accession to put into Belgaria. They chose it as their primary residence. So no, pe- mm. you know, the furniture doesn't match in every room in every living space. So I can only imagine when they were choosing these pieces of furniture. You know, who chose it for what reason? So it's really special because a lot of like the cupboards my grandfather had actually made for my grandmother. He designed that for her. So they were made with a lot of emblems and motifs from the Himalayan ranges to flowers, which are from the Himalayas or found around Nepal or the hills. So it's I I, I think in some way the the when you come into a heritage home, there's so much of handmade. Um, it's never going to be perfect, machine made. You know, look alike everywhere. It's really different because I think when you enter. Um, each piece of furniture, each color, each light, each um, tapestry or the upholstery, um, even the shape and size of the beds or mirrors were chosen for a specific reason. The one thing I do love is that all the rooms have these beautiful full length mirrors, at least the suites. And um, I can only imagine that's because a lot of the women and men took their time in dressing and dressing very stylishly at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I really listening to you. It felt like uh, I got a quick tour of the whole of Mayurbhanj, right? <laughs> it's like the whole of Mayurbhanj packed into the Belgaria Palace. It has elements <laughs> of everything, right from right from history to interesting people, the backstories, and uh, the arts also, right? Like you mentioned, uh, so much of the local art and handicrafts and um, everything has been imbibed in a lot of these uh, individual rooms, and each of them has their own characteristic. Uh, we'll definitely share a few quick write-ups about these interesting rooms too, so you can enjoy. And obviously, the uh, icing on top of the cake or a cherry on top of the cake is that you also get to feel like royalty living in a palace. So really, really a wonderful confluence of all of these different things. And uh, it clearly encapsulates what Mayurbhanj and the whole spirit of Mayurbhanj is all about. So thank you so much for beautifully describing uh, this to us, um, Akshita, because it's always hard, right? Uh, even pictures don't do justice, leave alone just words. So you've been so descriptive <laughs> and so beautifully, uh, beautiful in describing all of these uh, different aspects of the Belgaria Palace. Uh, really now makes me want to come visit as soon as uh, I get a chance yes, to. Yes, you must. Uh, <laughs> It's definitely there whenever I make um, a trip uh, back to India. Uh, and now, I guess uh, where you have to or where you want to stay while you uh, explore Mayurbhanj is kind of sorted, right? <laughs> the Bulgaria Palace is to, <laughs> the, the place to be in. Um, and a lot of Mayurbhanj you already explored living in the palace. Uh, I mean, uh, living at the property itself, right? Uh, you get a, a sense and you get a feel of a lot of the different things the place has to offer. Um, but what are the, some of the, say, quick things to do while someone is at mm-hmm. Bulgaria, right? You mentioned a few things in passing, right, from nature to arts, architecture. Yeah. Can we um, uh, deep dive into a couple of them, perhaps, uh, yeah. starting with um, Simlipal? There's definitely a lot of interesting waterfalls and uh, nature and the Tiger Reserve as mm-hmm. well, right? Uh, so Correct. you want to touch upon that, Akshita? Um, You know, I wish I could say that Belgaria encompasses Mayurbhanj, but honestly, we're just... <laughs> we, I would say you have to do you have to do a lot more in Mayurbhans to experience it, but I feel that Belgaria forms a very important part of, part of the story. Um, I will say that we have this saying in Mayurbhans called Bara uh, Masare mm. Tera Porbo, which means that in thirteen in twelve months we have thirteen festivals. <laughs> um, and the, the exciting thing that obviously uh, that's deliberate in this saying is that every month in Mayurbhans, because of the number of indigenous communities we have. Each of them has their own language, cuisine, festival, ways of dressing. So you should definitely spend time in driving through Mayurbhans, whether that's the north, south, east or west. They all they have their own flavor. Um, a must visit is the heart. The heart is like a bazaar. It happens weekly on you know Sundays and Thursdays. You can ask any local person and they can tell, they can point to the nearest one happening. This is really where you're going to experience Mayurbhans. I love going there. This is where I go grocery shopping. <laughs> so everything is fresh. You even sometimes see the barter system taking place, right? Um, because different mm. communities, uh, Mayurbhans is completely agrarian. We have 
uh, you know, very, uh, I mean, poultry, apart from poultry and livestock, there aren't any major industries or companies. And that in some way has been a blessing because people have been able to obviously, uh, you know, uh, certain areas of Mayurbhan still are famous for, whether it's spices or, you know, if you have told it to Simlipal, it's forest communities and, you know, what to purchase from whom, is it, it's, it's just been hereditary almost. Um, so in the heart, I think, you know, being able to see the local spices, foods, vegetables, uh, flo- you know, even crafts actually is, you know, amazing. And one thing, you know, for example, our main dish, I mean, someone from Ayurbhanj will, you know, never forgive me if I don't mention this, is Muri Mangso. So Muri Mangso is our puffed rice in Mayurbhanj is world famous. People actually pack it and take it back from here. We have a <laughs> brand called <laughs> Murmurin. Um, so our puff rice is really famous and we have it with mutton curry, which is absolutely amazing. They say that the goats here feast on sal leaves and that's why the mutton is extremely tender, very lean. Mm. And uh, so mutton curry is a must, which you should have from Garma Garam in Bari for that's one of the oldest uh, stores, like restaurants, family restaurants that have been serving it like things from the 1950s. I would also say go to the heart because we have um, and chutney as our delicacy as well. Sure. So you'll, you'll have that, mm-hmm. you find that in a lot of Eastern states. Apart from the local hearts and bazaars, I would say visit the 14th century Jagannath temple. After the Puri Rathyastra, <laughs> the one in Mayubhanj is the most famous in India and Odisha. And also because the goddess Subhadra's chariot is only pulled by women. Now this is an event where women are at the helm of a spiritual mm-hmm. event. And even for India and not just in the world, that's very, very unique. So, you know, you have thousands of thousands of women, the hundreds, pulling these chariots uh, down the road and of course no men in sight. <laughs> so um, that's really, really special. That happens in around June, July, uh, the Rath Yatra. Apart from that, I would say, you know, uh, visit the, um, in Mayurbhanj, you know, just in Baripuda at least, the heritage tour is really important. You get to see the main palace, go to the oldest museum of the state, which is the Baripuda Museum. Um, you know, even visiting the Jagannath Temple, the Bayapada Palace, the museum, they're all five, ten minutes from each other, but you get to see the collector's house. Um, the, the, for example, the State Bank of India used to be the Mayuban State Bank. So if you enter, you actually see this wall of uh, everyone from, you know, the Tatas and, you know, Hari Krishna Mehta, who is Orissa's first chief minister, all writing checks to the Mayuban State Bank or asking money from it. So that's really special to kind of see um, what the capital, the erstwhile, erstwhile princely states, how they became part of the new Indian democracy. So especially seeing in a place like Bayapada, which is so rural and dreary, and having the headquarters with a lot of these colonial architectures is really interesting. And uh, apart from the heritage tourism, the village tourism, so going to the Sabai grass self-help groups and actually seeing how they take the freshly cut Sabai grass, weave it with date leaves, with no machines at all, just a needle and thread, and create the most exquisite pieces of, you know, whether it's bags or mats or bowls, it's just, it's breathtaking and you can customize and make to order something and where else does that happen? That's the literal definition of couture. Um, and apart from that, if you go down to Udala, you have these beautiful handloom schools. So the Sabai Grass self-help group, if you just Google it on Google Maps, you can visit there. If not, just hit me up on Instagram or DM. I'm happy to tell you where it is. It's in a place near Barjor Dam. Um, the Udala Handloom School is called Mayur Dhwani. It's especially beautiful because they're trying to revive the motifs of Mayurbhanj from the 3rd century. And that's just a task in itself because so much of the textile industries of places like Mayurbhanj actually move to places. The artists move to places like Gujarat in search of better livelihoods. And so, so many villages lost the craft of handloom. So nor are they just not are they just bringing the loom back? They're actually reviving old motifs and techniques using ways. Um, I mean, I've I've been so blessed to actually see silk uh, worms being taken and made. You know, the silk and the fabrics being made from hand and scratch. And I I never had a context of how my clothes were made till I moved back to Mayurbhanj. Um, and so the Tassar Handloom School is amazing in Odla. That's why you see a lot of the handloom still there. Also, each of the tribes have their own uh, design and colors, so you can actually identify who was from which tribe in a heart because of the way they wear the dhoti or the drape. And so that's really beautiful. Um, I would also give a shout out to Galangaban and Lipsa Hembram. So if you are looking for handloom inspired by Mayurbhans, she's the best at it and just has some really interesting designs which showcase indigenous art with modern design. Uh, and you can purchase that online. Also, when you're in Baripuda, right next to Belgaria, there is Mayur Shilpa, which sells sabai if you can't go to the village. There's also Boyanika, which has the most exquisite range of handloom, saris, scarves from all across Orissa. 
it also picks up all these crafts from tribal groups across the state. So I think it's just amazing to shop there. And uh, right next to it is the Arisha tribal hand, uh, the craft, not craft, sorry, the, the store, the tribal store, which has, you know, Koraput coffee, it has a lot of spices, um, a lot of uh, soaps made from different tribal groups in Orissa, and especially in Mayurubhanj, the honey, the lemongrass is a must take. Like, I would definitely get that because our honey has this very special taste because it's all from Simlipal, which is a biosphere. And uh, they're made from rock bees. They're bees who actually make hives on these ancient rocks. So apparently that's, that mm -hmm. gives a flavor to it. So that's a must take. And if you miss all of that, you can still come to Bulgaria because we have our store houses <laughs> a little bit of all of this. And so you can get it directly from the source or you know, if you don't have the time, come stay with us and we'll make sure you get to do that. And one thing that I would say is, you know, um, you know definitely uh, visit that uh, one apart from the rural and the heritage tourism is we have we partnered with a lot of NGOs to have their artists or you know have their uh, whatever their mission is to have it being performed or showcased at Mayurbhanj. So we've collaborated with Project Chauni, which is a NGO that's reviving reviving the dying art form of Mayurbhanj Chau, which is actually performed by our soldiers. And after the mm -hmm. soldiers of a lot of the Uriya royal states got disbanded after the Pike Rebellion, they the dancers would actually tell the Britishers that they would they were just performing, they were dancing folk dances, but actually they were keeping their body uh, in check in case the king ever called them to fight a war. So now it's still called Mayurbhan Chau. Mm -hmm. It's actually a dance form that I'm also starting to learn. So it's very exciting for me to watch it all the time at my house, almost every other day. Uh, it's performed with swords and shields. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful art form that actually is performed without the mask, like its, um, its siblings, the Saraikila and the Purulia dance uh, form of Chau. So it's really beautiful to be able to see Mayurbhan Chau at uh, Belgaria as well. So that's a must-see, I would say. Yeah, so much, so much to unpack. I think uh, even a month-long visit uh, will probably be short to kind of uncover <laughs> a lot of these things. But... Uh, like I said, the sad part is a lot of people just don't know about this or are ignorant about these. And uh, even like you mentioned at the beginning, we mm -hmm. just are looking for an opportunity to take the first flight out and uh, go visit mm -hmm. uh, these exotic places where there is, whereas there's so much just hidden in our country waiting mm -hmm. to be explored. Um, that, that's a sad part of it. But I'm so, so, so glad that at least our, our future is in the right hands and in, uh, in terms of pa champions, of, uh, especially <laughs> Mayur Bhanjan. India in general, and in um, youngsters like you uh, who are actually coming forward, g getting back deep into the roots, right, uh, and also mm -hmm. sharing this with the world to know and why one should come uh, visit Mayur Bhanj and in this place, uh, and in this case Mayur Bhanj, and uh, also uh, how this this whole model can be made sustainable, right, by mm -hmm. keeping uh, or going with the community, to making sure everybody is involved in this process. So. For anybody who's even having second thoughts, uh, I don't know why you would now after <laughs> having uh, heard to Akshita for all this while. There's so many, so many things and reasons to come visit Mayurbhanj and Odisha, be it the people, be it the history, be it the rich culture and the heritage, the art forms. Uh, I'm just running out of words and running out of breath now <laughs> having to list out all of these things. But thank you, Akshita. It was really a pleasure to actually have a chat with you and learn all about all of these uh, really h hidden gems, I would say, right? Uh, it's high time that we take more notice. And uh, yeah, a great way to go local. I think we speak a lot about it, but uh, now's the yes. time to kind of uh, time to action upon it and um Take take uh, the first chance. Take your flight or drive down wherever you are uh, to uh, Mayurbhanj and to Belgaria. There's no better way of doing it. And uh, Akshita, for somebody looking to uh, learn more about you, learn more about mm -hmm. um, the Belgaria Palace, what's a good way of uh, either following you or looking you up on social media? Or what yes. would be best? So you can follow us on social media on, at the, in the handle at the rate the Belgaria Palace, or you can just email us on stay at the rate the Belgaria Palace dot com if you would like to make some bookings or have any queries and you can just visit our website for more information www.thebelgariapalace.com and in case you still want to come to Mayurbhanj and not stay at Belgaria just definitely google Mayurbhanj there are two or three other places to stay I'll also give them a shout out one is Aranya, uh, Aranya Nivas which is about 20 minutes and on the buffer zone of Similipal and there are also two or three other small homestays you can find on Airbnb um, one that I would recommend is also the Bhimkund Eco Stay, which is on the border of Mayurbhanj and Kiyonjar. 
but I always love to give a shout out to other young entrepreneurs and startups in and around Mayurbhanj who are doing their bit to promote tourism because if you want to, especially after the last two years, the devastation that it's caused in the economy, if you want to help out, just go travel somewhere. In some way or the other, you're directly or indirectly impacting economics and livelihoods in that place. So, you know, um, definitely a good, uh, many, many good reasons to travel within India right now. And uh, Seth, thank you so much for having me on here. In the beginning, I was like, oh my God, this is for one hour. What am I going to say? And I looked up and I can't believe it's been more than an hour. <laughs> so I'm really happy that I was able to, you know, you gave me the time and opportunity. And I'm really, really excited and looking forward to people who are listening to this podcast who have more questions about Mayurubhancha or Risa, just definitely reach out. And or we're always looking for collaboration and partnerships for residencies, retreats, or any other sort of collaboration. So this is just exciting to be on here and meet more people and, you know, get the word out and be an ambassador for the state as always. Thank you so much, Akshita. That was really brilliant and so, so, so inspiring even for uh, just as the Musafir stories, right? We are always trying to shed light and create awareness about uh, places within India and uh, you are such an inspiration to how be passionate about um, your own roots, your own background and uh, take that to the world. Uh, I don't think we have a shortage or a lack or dearth of uh, anything in terms of the history or the culture or the heritage or the arts and I think it's just a matter of being passionate about them and sharing mm-hmm. that with the world and thank you so much for sharing this so beautifully Akshita it was a pleasure to have you thank you thank you Johar and hope to see you very soon here that was yet another great episode on the Musafir Stories make sure to show us some love by sharing the podcast with your friends and family we are on Instagram and Twitter at Musafir Stories if you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can listen to us on the IVM podcast app or the website. Follow us on our social media. We are at IVM Podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. Hey everybody, it's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. On Think Fast, which is that invited me to talk about the evolution of the audio industry. And besides the audio industry, we talked about a whole bunch of other things like the Zomato Blinkit potential merger, the Mumbai 2050 climate plan, and a whole bunch of other things. Fun episode, do check that out. On Press Decode, Zara Vakta, Prafula, and Nivedita discuss the accuracy of the Kashmir files and associated movie politics. On The Longest Constitution, Priya examines the issue of livelihood along with why women aren't a part of parliament. On Say No to Drama, Chetna explains why you should celebrate filing your income tax rather than feeling bad about it. And on All Things Policy, the Takshashila folk discuss India's reserves of oil in light of the oil supply shock created by the Russia-Ukraine war. Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. And don't forget to rate us on any of the platforms you're listening to us on. Also, remember, we're on YouTube. You can check us out on ivmpodcast.com slash survey and get a list of all the YouTube channels we have active at this point. I'd also like to make a quick note that we're doing a small listener survey and it would really help us if you could fill that out. You can go to ivmpodcast.com slash survey. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors this week, SBI Life Insurance and India Water Portal. Thank you so much for making this possible. Ladies, I'm sure you will relate to it if I say that we are constantly busy with work, studies, cooking and what not. And amidst all of this, we often forget an important element that needs our desperate attention. Finance. So here we are, bringing to you SBI Life Presents A Sip of Finance. A women-exclusive podcast where we will teach you how to manage personal finances in a simple and straightforward way with your host Priyanka Acharya, a finance expert who's been in the industry for 14 plus years. And not just in English, but in seven more languages. So tune in every Tuesday for fresh episodes on the IBM Podcast Network and all major podcast streaming platforms.